I'm going to announce three things um, and probably do it again because we still have people uh, coming in from lunch. There is an after party band, refreshments, and food back here from 7 to 9. The hosts and sponsors are Zions Bank and Rolls-Royce. I suspect it will be a Rolls-Royce level party, and we thank Rolls-Royce and Zions Bank for the party they are going to give us from 7 to 9 tonight. Please. A number of people have asked how they get to, or what the story is about the event in Salt Lake City on Monday morning, which is uh, from, um, what time is it, Stephanie? When do we start? Come up here. This is Stephanie Mackay from the Columbus Community Foundation in Salt Lake City, and she's got 40 seconds. Okay. 40. Is this on? Yes. Yeah, I missed my call this morning. So we have a, a GIC event on Monday in Salt Lake from 8 to 12.30. The topic is the bottom line of uh, disabilities. We're going to be talking about the economic, financial, community impact of uh, not having uh, a lot of people uh, employed who have disabilities. And we're very grateful for the GIC to help us launch this first annual event. It will go on. Um, so uh, there is uh, information on the uh, Global Interdependence website for registration. We have a great, great lineup of speakers um, from all over. Our keynote speakers from Denmark who will be talking about a, um, a business model he uses for uh, employing y young adults with autism. So it's going to be a great, great event and thank you David now okay, getting us there uh, there's been an internet connection problem so if people come to the door or if they see you or see you at the party can you deal with all the administrative issues I can give How's you my card we, yes yes I, I will be there I will answer questions I'll give you my business card with an address and you can show up at 8 o'clock on Monday morning so please come yeah thank you so much okay and July 10th has been booked for next year here and details will follow. Um, we're logged in. We're ready to go, Leanne, I think. Let's see. Um, in keeping with the tradition this morning, we're going to prep the Federal Reserve Panel. Now remember, we're talking about successes and failures, outlook, future, forward guidance, words that we're learning. So we have another video clip, talks about hopes and dreams and is forward looking. Let's see the video. Hello there. Hello, how are you doing? I'm good, how are you? My name is Susan Boyle. I'm nearly 48, currently unemployed but still looking. And I'm going to sing for you on Britain's Got Talent today. Yeah, that's nervous. Yeah, sure, no. Yeah, well, that's, that's not surprising, but, you know, trying... I've got a fighting wood, you know. At the moment, I live alone with my cat called Pebbles. But I've never been married. <laughs> never been kissed. <laughs> oh, shame. <laughs> but it's not an advert. <laughs> and have you done this for many a year? Since I was 12. Since you were 12? I've always wanted to perform in front of a large audience. I'm going to make that audience rock. Hi, what's your name, darling? My name is Susan Boyle. Okay, uh, Susan, and where are you from? I am from Blackburn, near Bathgate, West Lothian. Oh, it's a big town. It's a sort of collection of... It's a collection of... Uh, villages. I had to think there. And how old are you, Susan? I am 47. <laughs> and that's just one side of me. <laughs> Okay, what's the dream? I, I'm trying to be a professional singer. And why hasn't it worked out so far, Susan? I've never been given the chance before, but here's hoping it'll change. Okay, and who would you like to be as successful as? Elaine Page. Elaine like Page. That. What are you going to sing tonight? I'm going to sing 
I dreamed a dream from the Miserables. Okay. Big so. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. I dreamed a dream in time gone by. Susan Boyle was unemployed. Paul Potts was a mobile phone salesman. Both are serious personalities in the world of opera, which means the solution to the employment problem is an operatic Federal Reserve. <laughs> We're going to have four quick slides. John Sylvia then will introduce our two presidents, and we're going to hear a very, very special message about Fed policy and where we're going. First, the questions. Do you have your iPads? You ready to go? Event pads? You ready to go? Okay. Here we go. First one. The Federal Reserve policy has been A. Extremely clear to me. B. Not sure what they are doing. It's fuzzy. And C. I don't understand, we have a mess. Ready, get set, go. And the answer is? Well, 26%, the rest are somewhere uh, with Clary. So there we go. That's an improvement over prior years. We're going to go to the second question. By December 31st of this year, 2014, the Federal Reserve should leave interest rates and policy unchanged, raise interest rates or withdraw stimulus 
add stimulus and expand the Fed's balance sheet? I don't know. Should. Ready, go. Well, there are the opinions in the room of what the Fed should do. Over half say raise rates or withdraw stimulus. All right, let's get to the next slide. Same question, only we changed the word to will. December 31st this year, the Federal Reserve will. Now, this is your forecast. A, leave interest rates alone, raise rates, add stimulus, and expand the balance sheet, or I don't know. Ready, get set, go. The forecast for the Fed. 60% leave interest rates alone. 9% uh, don't know. Okay, last question. Yeah, probably this is a good discussion. We, we can have this discussion, Charles. All right, one more. Now, some people, I understand this question is a little technical. The question is technical, but it's here for a reason. And if you're in the weeds in examining Fed policy or making it, it's a subject that we thought we would poll the audience since everybody in this room, oh no, uh, everybody but 3% of the people in this room are readers of the Wall Street Journal or Investors Business Daily or the Financial Times. So there's a very good skill level. So we're going to ask this question. The Fed's use of reverse repos. A, I understand how the Fed is using this RRP tool. B, I heard about RRPs, but I'm not sure how they work. And C, I don't know a thing about them. Forty-four percent do not know a thing about RRPs, and they are readers of the Wall Street Journal, the FT, and the Financial Times, or others. And 32 percent heard about them, but they're not sure how they work. I hope that's useful. I don't know, but we'll see. Let's get back to the slides. All right, we're going to go to John Sylvia to introduce our two speakers. We're going to have the Federal Reserve panel. Thank you. John. Thank you, Dave. Uh, again, it's always uh, fascinating to go through those surveys and uh, see people's responses uh, about the different topics overall. Uh, so uh, our first speaker um, is President Lockhart of the Fed Atlanta. Uh, basically covering the southeast part of the U.S. What makes uh, President Lockhart kind of interesting from uh, an economics perspective is his experience as a private investor and also as a banking executive. So President Lockhart, the floor is yours. Well, John, thank you for that introduction. And David, thank you for the wonderful setup with Susan Boyle and, and uh, those questions. Uh, <clears throat> I spent last weekend, 4th of July weekend, in uh, western North Carolina in the mountains um, at a wonderful place called the Swag Mountain Inn. And uh, at dinner one night, I got into a conversation with an Episcopal uh, cleric, an Episcopal minister, 
and a uh, criminal defense attorney. Uh, the criminal defense attorney mostly defended murderers, and of course the uh, Episcopal minister tried to save souls. We agreed that we had in our speaking engagement quite a bit in common. <laughs> And um, I'll let you ponder that, but the, uh, the, the, Episcopal, the Episcopal minister liked to start some sermons in the following way. He would look at the people in his congregation and he'd say, you know, you have a task, I have a task. Your task is to listen, my task is to give a sermon. If you finish your tasks before I finish mine, please raise your hands. Um, I, I'm going to ask you to do the same thing. But today I plan to focus my prepared remarks uh, before the conversation with John Sylvia and my colleague Charlie Evans on the question that is increasingly commanding the attention of Fed watchers, of mar uh, financial markets, and uh, of Fed policymakers. And in its most succinct form, the question is, when liftoff? I'll share with you as one policymaker how I'm approaching this policy question. And as always, I must emphasize that I'm presenting my individual views. My colleagues on the Federal Open Market Committee and in the Federal Reserve System uh, may not see things the same way. A useful place to start, I think, particularly given the reminder that we just got with some of the responses to the questions, is a quick review of the current stance of monetary policy here at the beginning of the third quarter. Completion of the tapering of asset purchases, which began last December, is now virtually a foregone conclusion. The minutes of the June FOMC meeting that came out just a couple of days ago indicated the asset purchase program will end in October. Uh, leaving just ongoing reinvestment of maturing securities. The majority of FOMC participants, through their individual quarterly projections, have indicated that the first move to raise short-term interest rates will likely come in 2015 or 2016. Opinions vary among FOMC participants on whether the first policy action ought to come earlier or later. Chair Janet Yellen, speaking for the committee in my view, has emphasized that the timing of the decision will depend on the evolution of the economy over coming quarters and there will therefore be substantially data driven. Finally, the committee has stated that once a tightening process begins, it's likely to proceed at a gradual pace. So that's where policy stands at the moment. Excuse me a second while I deal with a, a meltdown of my technology here. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> you know. I go to that old familiar paper copy. I'm sorry about that. Okay. Um, so what I'd like to go through today is my current framework for thinking about that question of when the conditions will be right for the first step to raise interest rates. First, I tie a, a liftoff decision to achievement of the Federal Open Market Committee's two monetary policy objectives, price stability and maximum employment. This is not to say that the committee must or should wait until those objectives have been fully and unarguably achieved. Rather, I think we will be in the zone of liftoff decision making when the outlook for accomplishment of these two objectives are in sight. By in sight, I mean uh, that given the trajectory of the economy, they are highly likely to be achieved in a reasonable time frame. You might call this a whites of their eyes approach to pulling uh, the trigger 
on raising rates. Determining that the economy is near achieving price stability and full employment is not entirely straightforward. Let me explain why. The FOMC has defined price stability as, two as a 2% rate of inflation over the long run as gauged by a particular index, the overall or headline index of personal consumption expenditures. I define price stability operationally to, the, to be therefore at or near 2% on a sustained basis. Speaking for myself, I can tolerate some deviation above or below the 2% target, providing inflation does not drift too far away from target for too long. Reading the course, the true course of inflation can be challenging because of normal month to month, quarter to quarter fluctuations in the data, as well as occasional shocks that cause episodes of transient changes in the numbers. Inflation has been running below 2% for quite a while a fact that has not gone unnoticed by the FOMC in devising its policy stance. Very recently, the PCE inflation numbers have been firming along with other measures of price trends. Over the first five months of the year, the year-over-year -year inflation rate according to the PCE index has risen from 1.2% to 1.8%. The three-month inflation rate which is presented on, as an annualized uh, rate, of course, has risen from 1.4% annual rate in January to 2.5% in May. The higher recent inflation numbers are welcome in my view, and I do not see this development as cause for alarm. At the same time, I don't feel enough evidence has arrived to be sure price stability is here or near. Inflation does not typically come forth in isolation. We should be seeing other indicators of the absorption of economic slack. We should uh, see accompanying wage growth, especially. So far, such affirmation of the sustainability of recent firming has been meager. The recent firming of price data removes some downside risk, in my opinion, but a test of time has not been met. It's a challenge also to arrive at an agreed definition of maximum employment. The conventional approach is to define maximum employment in terms of the Bureau of Labor Statistics official unemployment rate. It's called U3 on their scale. Today, U3 is at 6.1%. My working estimate for full employment on this basis is about, say, five and a quarter percent. So about a little bit less than 1% from where we are today. But a number of troubling employment phenomena have been, work, have been at work and make me less confident in the exclusive use of the unemployment rate. Two such phenomena are the drop in prime age participation uh, and the rise during the recession and subsequent slow reduction over the course of the recovery of people working part-time for economic reasons. In shorthand, that's called PTER. In current circumstances, a single measure of employment or unemployment does not provide a complete enough picture of what I care about in labor markets. I care about the full utilization, both quantitatively and qualitatively, of available labor resources. My assessment is the gap to be closed on the unemployment objective is bigger than estimated by a simple comparison of today's U3 unemployment rate and a projection of the equivalent unemployment rate at full employment. That said, the report that came out on July 3rd was certainly encouraging. As you know, the payroll survey showed an addition of 288,000 jobs 
and the unemployment rate fell to 6.1 percent. The trends and momentum are undeniably positive. We've seen four months in a row of quite healthy jobs reports suggesting that more is going on than just a rebound from the weather affected first quarter. My caution in declaring that I see the whites of full employment's eyes is closely linked to the still elevated level of involuntary part-time employment. That measure of labor utilization has been stubborn when compared to the decline of headline unemployment. The number of people working part-time for economic reasons increased in June. This series has been declining over the years, over the year, but over the last few months, it has toggled back and forth. Also, as mentioned earlier, we have uh, been seeing very little upward wage pressure. And this tells me there remains considerable actual slack in employment markets. I want to emphasize the important role of wage pressures as evidence that the employment gap is in fact closing. And for that matter, the inflation numbers are for real. Slow wage growth seems to be connected to the PTER, part-time for economic reasons, story. Studies have identified an empirical, empirical connection between slow wage growth and the elevated level of part-time employment. To cut to my bottom line, the FOMC is still somewhat short of a point where achievement of the two objectives is confidently in sight. Importantly, the two objectives remain complementary. The same basic policy posture can promote accomplishments, accomplishment of both objectives, in my view. At the moment, there is little or no trade-off between the two objectives, but that could change, uh, but that's how I see the situation for the foreseeable future. There's another aspect of my framework for thinking about the circumstances that should accompany a decision to begin raising rates. I'm also considering the risk picture. Specifically, there are two risk concerns on my screen. First, given that the committee is seeking to approach a 2% run rate of inflation from below, I think we have to contemplate the risk of a prolonged overshoot of 2%. I don't believe the recent broad-based uptick of inflation measures necessarily portends that inflation is going to get out of hand. Inflation expectations have remained well anchored. There is no sign that price makers or the general public anticipate a break with the experience of price stability the country has enjoyed for more than two decades. I'm also monitoring the risk situation as regards financial system stability. With equity indexes at or near historic highs, financial volatility, financial market volatility very low, and evidence of reach for yield behavior, concern about the financial system and financial instability has been building. In the thinking of some observers, the potential for a rash of damaging uh, financial system instability can be associated with a continued low rate environment. Again, while remaining watchful, I'm not overly concerned that financial market conditions today map to systemic risk concerns with high potential for spillover to the real economy the Main Street economy, if you will. My emphasis on systemic and spillover is intentional. I see a difference between some degree of fragility in financial markets due to investors widely carrying risk on positions and the realistic chances of a broad systemic meltdown that engulfs the broad economy. I think the latter should be the Fed's and the FOMC's greater concern. A policy position always uh, involves a trade-off of real or potential cost versus benefits. 
In my view, the potential and achievable benefits of sustaining very accommodative monetary stimulus based on a policy rate in the range of 0 to 25 percent beyond year-end 2014 and into next year continue to outweigh the possible costs. My outlook for the economy in coming quarters underpins my judgment on the cost-benefit trade-off of current policy. The key element of my outlook is a run rate of GDP growth at or better than 3% through the next several quarters. I'm focusing on the run rate as opposed to a projected full year 2014 GDP growth rate because the weak first quarter will push down the full year arithmetic. I think the run rate in, uh, from the second quarter onward, and we haven't gotten second quarter official numbers yet, is more relevant to policy decisions ahead. On balance, recent data have supported a 3% GDP growth rate assumption. I'm still prepared to believe that the first quarter contraction was an anomaly attributed substantially to weather and inventory adjustment, healthcare spending, and exports. However, if there were temporary or unusual factors at work depressing the first quarter, then it's reasonable to expect that the lifting of those factors provided a bump in the numbers in the second quarter and may also have been transitory. There's quite a divergence between what we thought was happening in the first quarter based on tracking estimates in real time uh, during the quarter and the ultimate verdict on the first quarter. Tracking the economy in real time is very hard. The Bureau of Economic Analysis first told us uh, first quarter growth was one-tenth of one percent, a positive number, but one-tenth of one percent. This first estimate of first quarter, first quarter growth was almost three percentage points off their most recent and final reading on the first quarter. My point is that it will likely be hard to confirm a shift to a persistent above-trend pace of GDP growth, even if the second quarter numbers look relatively good. This experience suggests to me that we can misread the vital signs of the economy in real time. Notwithstanding the mostly positive and encouraging character of recent data, we policymakers need to be circumspect when tempted to drop the gavel and declare the case closed. In the current situation, I feel it's advisable to accrue evidence and gain perspective. It will take some time to validate an outlook that assumes above, ten, uh, above trend growth and associated solid gains in employment and price stability. So for those reasons, I'm sticking to the view that I've stated recently that condi conditions that would justify a liftoff decision are most likely to arrive in the second half of next year. Thanks so much. Uh, our next speaker is President Evans of the Fed in Chicago. Chicago, of course, is the upper Midwest of the country. Uh, he's done amazing research on how monetary policy impacts growth, inflation, and financial markets, and he has a, a list of publications in very prestigious journals that I am very jealous of. But uh, President Evans, it's all yours. Oh, thanks very much. Thanks, and uh, thanks for the in invitation to speak here. It's a, a real honor. It's a very nice forum. Uh, let me start off by saying, um, I guess the, 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 the standard caveat is that these are my views and not anybody else's. However, I will say that I agree very much with uh, pretty much everything that uh, my colleague Dennis Lockhart says that's uh, very close to my own views. And so because of that, let me take the opportunity to uh, address what I think the theme of this conference is, uh, successes and failures of monetary policy. I'd like to discuss a mainstream framework for assessing success and failure of monetary policy, which I call bullseye accountability. So I'm here to help explain this framework so that the next time you take that quiz, you can feel more confident that you understand 
what we're doing. All right, having said that, let's hope this works. There, uh, I went too far. Okay, um, well, this is uh, our centennial year. The Fed has been around for 100 years, and so let me just take the opportunity to mention, if you, if you, if you think about our 100-year experience, I'd say that there are three events that uh, we're reminded of very quickly. The first one is the Great Depression in the 30s, and this was a period where monetary policy failed to counteract the uh, large reduction in aggregate demand, the big fall in real GDP, and the enormous fall in the price level. Um, price level fell by a third, according to the Wholesale Price Index. Friedman and Schwartz studied this period, and they have the quote up there, inept monetary policy failed to adequately combat credit contraction, deflation, and depression. So uh, first lesson from this is that central banks are supposed to defend their nominal anchor, that's, that's, that's monetary when the nominal variables decline, we have to respond to that. Second event, the great inflation began, if you look at the data, sometime in the mid-60s and then by the 70s, inflation was getting out of hand. And here, monetary policy failed to recognize that the structure of the U.S. economy had changed and so the real side of the entire economy was not nearly as favorable towards employment prospects and growth as they had previously thought. And so they were pushing on monetary policy and they were generating ultimately double digit inflation. So here the lesson is we have to pay very close attention to structural changes in the real side of the economy uh, as well. And then the third one uh, is an example from the 50s, the Treasury Accord, which my takeaway from this is that it's very important to have uh, an autonomous central bank that can go about doing its business, meeting its objective, and taking very hard decisions which other short-term policymakers might not like to take. We call it independence, um, but we also have to be held accountable. So all three of those things are very important. And as it turns out, our recent um, adoption of an explicit long-run strategy for monetary policy in January 2012 encompasses all, each of these three elements. The first one is we adopted an explicit inflation objective of 2% as measured by the Personal Consumption Expenditure Index. 2% inflation is what we're expected to deliver. Not too much higher, not too much lower. Uh, the real side of the economy that we need to pay attention to, we have to pay attention and note that certain sustainable features of that economy might be changing over time. So here we point to the sustainable unemployment rate I see in the graphics aren't working very well. It's supposed to be the um, unemployment rate, the natural rate, and it has a time subscript. So the unemployment rate is somewhere between five and a quarter and five and a half percent according to the uh, SEP projections from the committee. Um, and then the third thing is we're supposed to take a balanced approach to reducing deviations of inflation and employment from these long-run objectives. Well, at the moment, uh, Dennis talked uh, very well about the current economic situation. The unemployment rate remains high at 6.1 percent against this sustainable natural range. And inflation is still uh, low, and it's below our 2 percent uh, objective. So now let me, let me move to describing the framework for assessing success and failure. I've got too many slides, and in the interest of time, I'm going to skip ahead. Inflation's low. Inflation expectations are low. It's low around the world. Um, every time I turn. Ah, it's a catastrophe, isn't it? OK, all right. Well, all right, so anyway, unfortunately, the algebra didn't translate very well here. But um, so at any rate, um, so what this is is um, we start off with uh, a loss function for policymakers. So what's a little bit unusual for the U.S. situation is we have a dual mandate. We're supposed to be uh, delivering 2% inflation and also unemployment, a real side of the economy, which is at its sustainable rates. The loss function is supposed to be a quadratic objective function in the inflation deviation, and then it's supposed to be the deviation of output from its potential trend level. You have to decide on what the weights are for this. And John Taylor, back in 1979, did seminal work in macroeconomics where he used this approach. Um, and he, his analysis, which is empirical, indicated that about a quarter weight on the output gap against a one weight on inflation seemed to be about the right uh, weights for that. Now, if you convert this to 
the unemployment rate instead of the output gap, then you end up with equal weights on the unemployment rate and inflation that comes out of Oaken's law. So we've got equal weights on inflation and unemployment. So then I've got this graphical representation of that where the inflation objective is 2%. So the vertical line is when you're at the target, the horizontal line. The, the vertical line is when the unemployment rate's at the natural rate. I've got it at like 5.4%. And when you're in the crosshairs, the bullseye, that's when you're achieving both of your objectives. And I've got bullseye colors here for a little bit of fun. You want to be in the red. The green's pretty good, too. OK, so um, this displays combinations of inflation and unemployment, which are equally distasteful, if you will, an equal policy weight. So if you're on the circle, any combination around the circle is equally undesirable. So one way that you can think about this is if you look at that two September 2011 dot, unemployment was 9%. And I kind of said, well, how does that correspond to, um, in, in inflation terms, how far away we are from our employment objective? Well, if you go around the circle to the point where if you were at your employment objective, the natural rate of unemployment, at the top of that, it would be 5.8% inflation. So that 9% unemployment rate is equivalent to an inflation rate of 5.8%. And a central banker is not going to tolerate 5.8% inflation. They're going to work very hard to bring it down. The same logic holds that when you're at 9% unemployment, we need to be working very hard to bring it down. And so we've had very accommodative monetary policies uh, to deal with that. And you can see the, project, uh, the progression of... Uh, um, outcomes in 2012, we improved a little bit on the employment side. Uh, 2013, still improved, but inflation's going down. The red dot is the most recent quarterly combination of these things. And then you've got this progression, projections for 2014, 15, and 16. We're slowly expecting to glide up into the bullseye area. It's not going to be particularly fast, and it's really going to feel kind of like threading the needle, that we're just kind of going to get up there um, in time. So for me, credibility as to whether or not we're achieving our monetary goals, it's goal-oriented, is that we get to the bullseye as quickly as is feasible. So getting to the bullseye is very important. Now, different combinations. I've changed the scale a little bit. It's the same thing, but I've got this orange cone and it takes off from 2013. So anything in the orange cone is an improvement over the 2013 outcomes. As we move towards the bullseye, those are better outcomes. And you can see that uh, the red current dot is where it is. So the projections are showing that we're constantly improving. That's true, but there are also many combinations which uh, would also be quite an improvement over 2013. For instance, a lot of that uh, uh, range of inflation above 2% is actually an improvement over what we have now and what we had in 2013. So a chart like this is intended to remind you that this framework is we're supposed to be hitting 2% inflation. It's not a ceiling. Just because it's above 2% doesn't mean that that's a catastrophe. We're supposed to be delivering on average 2% inflation. And this framework shows you that 2.5% inflation really isn't that awful compared to what we've been experiencing when unemployment is higher. So that's a, um, one thing that comes out of this uh, framework. Now, I said that there are equal weights on inflation and unemployment here. And so you might, you might sort of say, well, wait, Charlie. Equal weights, that's uber dove kind of talk. Maybe you should have more weight on the inflation deviation, like some other central banks that uh, are uh, more intolerant. Suppose you double the weight on the inflation deviation, so that's much more costly to you than the unemployment deviation. The red ellipse now becomes the combinations of inflation and unemployment that would give rise to the same loss as the current red dot. Oh, that would indicate that it would be a 3% inflation rate at the natural rate that would be equally distasteful, not the 3.2. It doesn't really have that big of an effect. We're still pretty far away from the natural rate, and unemployment moving to the other side of 2 
um, would not really be a big loss compared to what we've been seeing. Um, okay, so let me wrap up. I could go on, but I think you'd probably prefer to have your own questions answered. Oh, that's exactly right. Um, so let me stop here. This is the famous dot chart out of the SEPs that we display quarterly. It's the funds rate, um, and it's um, what the committee members are expecting appropriate policy would be. You answered a question like that that uh, David you know, had. What do you think policy should be at the end of the year? This is the committee's answer to the should question. Under appropriate policy, what should it be? There's only one committee member that voted with you in that case, which is that the funds rate should be above where it is right now. In 2015, you begin to see many more committee members that think, oh, you should have a lift off, and some that think that the increase should be pretty quick, apparently. And then in 2016, we're spread um, quite a lot. Um, which path of monetary policy is most likely to get us to the bullseye with sustainability? That's the first order question. And these dots display an honest difference of opinion over how the economy will behave and what should be done. But for me, I will simply say that that market expectations path, I've got two other paths there. One's the Taylor 93 path, that green line, and then the inertial Taylor rule is the red one. And then the market expectations is the black one. And uh, I think that's a lot closer um, to what I would say it ought to be um, that would be most likely to deliver cone of improvement type of outcomes. Okay, well, with that very brief um, presentation, I'm going to yield my time back to uh, John and hopefully take as many questions as we can. Thank you. So we'll open it up uh, to some questions. I have uh, 27 questions, but uh, being the generous person that I am, I'll limit it to two, uh, one for each speaker. Uh, first one, of course, President Lockhart. Um, I wanted to build a little bit upon what John Musso and, and Natalie Cohen had talked about uh, particularly with respect to the financial markets and trying to assess uh, surprises in the financial marketplace. You talked about financial system stability. And so given your private sector background, what, what are the kind of signs that we could perhaps use, volatility, spreads, whatever, to judge to what extent we are moving from an, an investment environment to a more speculative environment? Well, some of my, my private sector back, background might be applicable in a, in a more qualitative way to answering that question. And I have memory of the dot-com period, for example, and earlier periods where valuations got to be extremely high, extremely robust, if you will. And I'd like to take that tack in answering your question. Uh, when you begin to hear from colleagues or from from observers that this time it's really different, uh, that the laws of financial gravity have been rescinded, um, and that uh, cycles are an antiquated idea, then I think it's time to get a, a little bit wary. Um, uh, whether we're talking financial assets or uh, real assets, uh, when uh, particularly in the case of real assets, investors are essentially claiming that they will, they will gain, they will, uh, uh, they will, their value of their assets will appreciate simply by the market carry, as opposed to some form of adding value to the asset. Again, I think that's a time in which to get uh, a, a little bit wary. And finally, when talking to colleagues um, and they claim uh, you're seeing perhaps some crazy things going on, and they claim that they'll be smart enough to know when to get out versus other participants in the market. I think that's a time to get very wary. I, I'm not sure I see those behavioral aspects, uh, you know, let's call it uh, universally at work today. Uh, for that reason, uh, although certainly financial asset valuations are high around the globe and, and here in the United States. Um, I, I'm, I'm not overly concerned that we're going to see anything more than a market correction kind of thing happen. Sounds good to me. Uh, President Evans, uh, again, you know, given your background about monetary policy impacting the overall economy, 
there's a lot of discussion about uh, monetary policy impacting the unemployment rates, but particularly splitting short-term versus long-term unemployment. And to some extent, it seems like short-term unemployment is a little bit more in line with what people think is, quote, normal, but long-term unemployment stays pretty high. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Um, you're right. There has been a good deal of research on that, and uh, sort of the time series econometric analysis could, you know, build a case for the fact that it's the short-term unemployment rate that seems to be a better predictor of future inflation uh, pressures. It's possible that uh, the current time is is a bit different. My own staff has looked at this, and it it kind of depends on how you bucket the short term and the long term. So if you add a third bucket, if you the, the short term, the really short term is behaving very differently. So the people who have only been unemployed for um, a month or or so is is really moving down. And then if you do the you know from from uh, one month to, to six months, that, that looks even more like the long-term unemployment, I believe, if, I, if I'm remembering my staff on that. So um, the dynamics are even more complicated than I think some of the um, broad brushstroke uh, analysis that we've seen. But you know, ultimately, in terms of how monetary policy is going to be affecting um, these margins, I think that the transmission mechanism is going to continue to be the same old one, which is we're providing accommodative financial conditions. We're trying to um, incent entrepreneurs and other decision makers who see good opportunities in front of them to be able to um, finance that at you know a reasonably attractive uh, rate and undertake that uh, prudent risk uh, to expand the economy. I think ultimately what we needed is uh, more customers walking through the door. When they're doing that to the point where firms can't keep up, they're going to expand their uh, facilities, their production, and their workforce, and they're going to draw from the easiest uh, folks to hire with just the right skills, and then when you've got the economy going the way that it has in past uh, vibrant expansions, they're going to start hiring everybody. Oh, uh, one, one quick technical question. Um, in one of your slides, you had time varying. What, 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 do you, what do you mean by that? So the, the natural unemployment rate. So if you look back at the 70s, one of the big complaints is uh, the Fed thought that the natural rate of unemployment was like 4% or maybe 5%, but in fact it had probably moved up to 6%, and so you couldn't really achieve lower unemployment through monetary policy without uh, getting roaring inflation. And so being, being aware of that and paying a lot of attention to that is uh, fundamentally critical. Um, so we'll open it up to questions. And just one reminder, um, questions about current congressional legislation or legislation and process is generally off limits. I think there's a question up here and then the lady second. First of all, thank you both for coming. Um, in addition to it's the monetary policy role that you've talked about in your presentation, another key role of the system of Federal Reserve Banks, of course, is overseeing the nation's banking system, ensuring both uh, the soundness of the system, but at the same time, enough liquidity and credit for growth. Um, this morning, your colleague, the president of the Philadelphia Bank, talked about achieving a balance in that role. And just three data points I wanted to ask you about. One, I see that uh, loans and leases as a percent of banks' balance sheets, I believe, are at their lowest level since 1978. So that's 36 years ago. Two is we've dropped below 7,000 banks in the United States I believe for the first time since 1891. And three, last year there was a de novo charter for a small bank in Pennsylvania, Burdenham Bank, which was the f first de novo bank charter in the US in four years. Last time we went four years without a de novo bank charter in the US was the Civil War. So in light of those three data points, do you feel that the FRB system is achieving that balance of, on the one hand, reducing the risks that were evident before, but making sure that credit is being made available to Main Street and to, to in particular, smaller companies and smaller communities like Jackson, Wyoming? Well, I'll take a whack at that question, and then perhaps uh, Charlie would like to add something. From sure. First, the financial system is in far, far better condition, uh, the banking system, than, than, let us say, 2008. That's almost an obvious uh, point. Uh, but it has uh, really been strengthened dramatically by raising capital, by imp improving risk processes, uh, by uh, essentially shedding um, or writing off assets that were, that were underperforming. So we have a much stronger banking system. I, I'd like to believe that the 
activities of the Federal Reserve System in implementing the law as given to us by Congress um, has in fact contributed to that better situation. You raise the question of the number of banks and, and, and also the dearth of de novo activity. I spoke on this just a few days ago with a group of community bankers in, in Louisiana. Um, and I take the view, my personal view is that we still have too many banks, that, uh, that we are an overbanked country, and that um, banking, like it or not, and this does include the cost of compliance and the cost of, of dealing with regulatory requirements, is a, increasingly a scale business, and that we'll see far more consolidation in the industry, which on balance will be a good and necessary thing. So I wouldn't take the 7,000, the dropping below 7,000, as necessarily a bad sign. In fact, I, I think we'll probably see the evolution of this banking system to uh, numbers that are far below that in coming years. Because just to be realistic, um, it's, this is not a mom and pop business any longer. It takes a certain scale to, to be able to afford everything you have to do, including investment in technology, uh, to be able to operate a bank. So let me stop there. Maybe Charlie has something to add. That's pretty complete. Uh, Madam? Hi, thank you. Um, I had a question about the long-term unemployed and the lack of labor force participation, labor force participation being at, you know, 30-year lows. It, I just was interested in your views on the transmission mechanism there if rising wage rates become broad-based inflation. Is, is that possible? in an economy where 40% of the people are sitting on the sidelines, and how are you evaluating that or thinking about that at the Fed? Thank you. So um, that's a good question. We have um, noticed uh, that uh, labor force participation rate has come down uh, very quickly and over you know, some period of time, actually. Um, a lot of research has been done uh, in the Federal Reserve System and, and elsewhere. My own staff had been pointing to demographic factors that would be leading to falling labor force participation rates as, as long ago as 10 years. I mean, you could kind of see the demographics forming. Um, and, and also it's the fact that younger uh, people um, don't work as much as they used to, like when they're going to college, they don't do that or, or other things. And so there's just a whole host of uh, factors that have led us to predict falling labor force rates, and in fact, they've been coming through. Now, labor force has fallen even more than those predictions, and so there does seem to be a cyclical component to this where we've overshot that trend reduction, and I think that's the part that your question is kind of getting to. But my staff estimates that that's about a third of the um, the gap in the, a, a third of the labor force reductions that are cyclical, which means that they, they could come back when the economy is doing very well. If wages start to pick up, people who are discouraged could come back. Um, on top of that, um, in Dennis's remarks, he pointed out very, very well that it's the, the part-time for economic reasons uh, folks that are, uh, that's really very large. Now, they're in the labor force, but that's another measure of slack. You would expect that they would also want full-time work um, when it's available and as wages increase. So I think that's one reason why we could expect the unemployment rate not to fall as quickly in coming quarters as we have seen before, because as things get better, as more people are lo looking and finding jobs, they'll, they'll come back, and that labor force might just stay flat. That would be a pretty good thing if it stayed flat. They, they could even come back in, in numbers, but it could be flat because we're still projecting downward trends there. So we have another five or 10 minutes for questions. And I think we have one question there, and I don't know if anybody up there has a question. Okay, there's a gentleman in the second balcony up there. Just jump down and uh, <laughs> get, get the mic down here. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I can hear you. Go ahead. You got a question, sir. Uh, one, wonderful presentations, both uh, Dennis and Charlie. Uh, particularly in your uh, presentation, Charlie, you mentioned the time-varying nature of your estimate of the natural rate of unemployment sometimes referred to as Nehru, of course, and I think Dennis touched on it as well with the five and a quarter type of number. So I think the profession generally agrees uh, that Nehru is a time-varying uh, phenomenon. My question is, is the constant term, or the alpha in the Taylor rule, also time-varying? John put down 2% a long, long time ago when we were all in short pants, and a lot has changed over the years. What are your two estimates 
of the alpha term in Taylor for today, not history, but for today? Well, I, I think that's a very important question, and uh, I've spoken about this uh, a little bit in, at previous conferences. Um, the mistake that the Fed made in the 70s by not paying attention to the time-varying nature of the Nehru is um, the same type of mistake that you could make in a Taylor rule if you thought that constant term you know, was fixed at 2%. And frankly, 2% is a big number. I think it's actually kind of hard to get a real rate that's 2%. Um, a lot of people have been marking down their trend GDP growth rate, and uh, you know, a standard growth model is going to tell you that that real rate is going to move down somewhat in proportion. How much? I don't know. But uh, I think 2% is uh, uh, really a very aggressive number. And if you were going to put a lot of weight on that, that, that 93 version of the Taylor rule is a benchmark that you be, should be paying attention to. I really think you need to uh, um, take that time variation in, into account. And gentlemen, sir, you had a question? Yeah. Uh, a couple of eons ago when I was at school, we learned a formula called Y equals M times V. Uh, I don't know if that's still a valid formula or not, but in my recollection it works something like the GNP was the product of the supply of money times the velocity of money. We've seen the supply of money jump. What goes on with the velocity of money these days? Is that still something anybody measures, pays any attention to? Does it have any impact on uh, where the economy's going? Charlie may remember the history better than I do, but uh, I can say that there's very little attention to velocity of money. It's a very elusive thing to measure and consequently really doesn't factor much into our, our deliberations. And I think it, must, it was certainly before my time, but it would have been in the 90s when essentially the monetary policy um, regime shifted from targeting aggregates and then therefore thinking that velocity of money would uh, be part of the equation to focusing on interest rates and trying to set or trying to influence interest rates. When that shift took place, I think uh, some of the emphasis on velocity uh, left the equation. I mean, the whole underpinning for that style of analysis is that velocity is a uh, stationary variable that doesn't move around very much. And, uh, you know, it's just uh, moved around unbelievably. That's why with financial innovations, all, all of that, it's basically been impossible to find a monetary aggregate for which velocity has fulfilled that uh, stable relationship. Back in the late 80s at the board, one of my colleagues later came to Chicago, uh, Dick Porter, was part of the uh, P-Star uh, development, and uh, it was M2 that seemed to have a stable relationship for velocity. That lasted about five years, maybe, and then it started moving around as well. The, the inverse of velocity is money demand, and, you know, so we have been, at one level, providing a tremendous amount of reserves, certainly, and the monetary base has gotten to be very, very large. Um, but demand, demand for safe assets has been very large during the financial crisis, and so one interpretation of this is we've just been trying to uh, fulfill parts of that. But the test of this is, given our extremely large balance sheet, if there were implications coming out of this MV equals PT type of a relationship, you ought to see it in inflation. Haven't seen anything yet. So one last question, sir. The gentleman's question is, is about, I think, general regulatory, but policy uncertainty. And for those of you that have not seen, uh, there was an interesting paper written a couple of years ago with respect to policy uncertainty, and there's some graphs and stuff like that uh, out of Stanford. So if you gentlemen would like to address that. I'll say a couple things. Um, first, uh, the ideal world is when fiscal policy and monetary policy kind of work together and create the outcomes that we have targeted, that we're statutorily required to focus on, um, and also are good generally for the country. Um, 
and its strategic evolution. That's the ideal world. And um, early in, in and after the crisis, um, Chairman Bernanke and others would comment that at that particular time, we were really providing very stimulative, very aggressive, aggressive monetary stimulus, and, and the fiscal side was working against that, perhaps for valid reasons, but nonetheless, it was there was a netting effect in terms of the influence on the economy. And then, as John pointed out, uh, over the last five years, there have been at least two or three spells in which, uh, and I picked this up both conceivably in the data, but more importantly, in anecdotal feedback from business people, there have been two or three spells where policy uncertainty on the fiscal side, taking the, the national debt limit to, uh, to the last night, uh, really did uh, have a damping effect on the enthusiasm of business people to take bets and investments or to, to hire people. So both of those, I think, are aspects of, of, of this question, and uh, we are now in a much better period, all things considered. Um, I would say there's somewhat less of that uh, fiscal policy uncertainty. Maybe this is an interlude. It probably is, for we have to deal with entitlements later in the decade. Um, but we're in a little better situation now. Um, there, there, something about your question makes me want to uh, re remind everybody about those three lessons that I uh, started off with. Um, you know, suppose we found ourselves in a situation where there was some impediment in place. It could be uh, government uh, policy towards health care or something that uh, prevents people from wanting to take risks, and so maybe employment's not proceeding as well uh, as we would like. Can monetary policy do something about that? Well, it might be the case that the structure of the economy has changed and we'd have to take that into account and the answer could be we can't do much about that. But it could also be the case that that type of structural change or that policy could be leading to a reduction in aggregate demand that ultimately has a, a negative effect on inflation, that inflation ends up being below our target. It is our responsibility as a central bank. As soon as we say our target, long-run target for inflation is 2%, we're supposed to deliver 2% because all financial interest rates are priced as if we're going to do that. And so if you end up taking out a mortgage or some type of uh, interest burden and then inflation comes in lower, that's a higher real burden. In the same way that if inflation is too high, then it's an easier burden, but somebody else is hurt. So even if we have difficulty moving the real side of the economy, we always must make sure that our policies are directing inflation back towards where its target is. And in the current environment, unemployment's too high and inflation's too low. There's not even a, a trade-off at the moment. Yeah, I think if, if you want the graph that Bloom uses, it reinforces President Lockhart's comment that it has come down significantly since the debt limit. If you want the graph, just contact me. I'll, I'll email you the graph. And thank you all for the questions. And Dave? There's one more question. Uh-oh. Yeah. The, the prerogative of uh, oh, MC. And it's in response to the third survey question. Old days, we had a penalty rate, we had a floor, we had a federal funds target, and we lived with that corridor for a long time. And then we have a crisis, and now we have things like interest on reserves, a new phenomenon for us who observe. Interest on excess reserves. Interest on excess <coughs> reserves, I s correct and reverse repos, a federal funds rate, which seems to be, if not eliminated, certainly not functional. And that has created for the observer some uncertainty as to how this plays out. Could you each maybe comment on these new tools, how you see them evolving, and what normal might look like in their relationship once we get away from the zero bound. You see, I have no control over him. Yeah. The audience I could control. We have uh, 35 more minutes for this question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll start, and Charlie can, can weigh in as well. First, I'll draw your attention to the minutes of the last FOMC meeting, which 
uh, explained that we have gone through two meetings in which we have discussed normalization and how these things will work. And we have not yet come to final decisions on exactly what the mix of tools will be, their relation to each other, and uh, therefore uh, you might call it operationally how we will actually execute normalization when it, when it occurs. Uh, th there will certainly be one or more meetings to continue to refine those things. So anything I would say, first I would say would, would have to lean on what has been out there publicly in the minutes and, and secondly is my opinion of what I'm, I think is the direction. I think the, um, uh, there will be a, a prominent role for interest on excess reserves as a rate that we can set. It's not a market rate, um, and therefore it will play an important role. I think the federal funds rate will continue to be part of the mix and will be uh, communicated perhaps with a, a slightly different definition than we've had in the past or a broader definition. And I see a role for overnight reverse repos, uh, but a supporting actor role, not, not the, the main event. And in that role, it would probably set a floor uh, for interest rates um, where the Fed funds rate and the interest on excess reserve rates will really be the most influential tools. That's the kind of how I see things uh, shaping up. Uh, I agree with that explanation, um, and, and, you know, part of this is what's important for, what does the public really need to, you know, think about here versus what financial market participants, financial market participants want to know exactly the details of exactly how we're going to implement policy, because there's a lot at stake in terms of transactions and things like that, but for the public, the most important thing is that at the moment, you know, our short-term policy rate is essentially zero. We're going to come to the time where it's going to be extremely appropriate for us to begin tightening financial conditions in order to be more consistent with the stronger economy and whatever inflationary pressures we might, you know, be facing. And with these tools, short-term market rates are going to begin to increase so that things like auto, lane, auto loans are going to be more expensive. Mortgages are going to be a little bit more expensive. Business financing will be a little bit more expensive. The normal transmission mechanism, I expect, will come back and we'll be using a variety of these tools potentially in different ways in order to affect that. Ladies and gentlemen, we've had a remarkable conversation. Please thank our two Fed presidents. <laughs>